You know, it is a great pleasure to finally meet Scott Yu, music director, uh, artistic director of the uh, Festival Mosaic in San Luis Obispo. Uh, he's also just been appointed uh, uh, music director of the uh, Mexico City Philharmonic. Uh, he has a, he's a fabulous violinist since forever, since you were, you know, a babe uh, at age three, like so many great violinists in the world. Uh, we're going to talk about all of that, but particularly we want to focus on Festival Mosaic, which is happening in San Luis Obispo. It's in its 46th season. Some of you that are as old as I am will remember that it used to be called San Luis Obispo Mozart Festival, once upon a distant planet, founded in 1971. Scott is, now this is the really fun part, Scott is the second music director in the entire history, 46 years of that festival. So we're talking stability. Many of you up in the uh, Central Coast in San Luis Obispo area are going, are, are very well aware as I am of Cliff Swanson, who founded this festival in 71. And the, it is a two week festival. Uh, we're running, we're talking Wednesday, July 13th, through Wednesday, July 20th. Scott brings in members of orchestras from all over the United States and the world. It's fascinating. Uh, there are some very big and very important concerts coming up that I'm going to ask Scott to, to uh, discuss. Scott Yu has been uh, music director of the festival Mo Mosaic since 2005. Uh, and we assume there will be many more happy years unless some big, big, big other orchestra takes him away. And I'm going to want to ask you what, how, about that transition. You studied with Michael Tilson Thomas, the transition, you know, when you went from fiddle to conducting and how that all works and how on earth you have time. But, but let's, let's just get, get started with just the basics. Scott, give me an overview of this enormous festival. It has a, a fringe element. It has special dinners. Uh, prices, by the way, range from uh, 30 bucks to about 80 bucks and then some, you know, a little bit more for special dinners and such. Scott, get, if you can, in less than four hours, give me a little overview. <laughs> when I walk around San Luis Obispo after the festival, and I speak to people who, you know, you, you'll every five feet you'll you'll see somebody who's been to a festival event, and you ask them, uh, "So, uh, Mr. Johnson, what did you see?" Um, they invariably reply. I saw one mission, and I saw one pack, and one dinner, and they, they go by venue. Um, people, people think of our concerts by venue, not by repertoire. So we try, to, we try to put concerts in as many different venues as we possibly can in the county, and it's a lot of fun. You have to program according to the venue. We're doing a short lunch notable encounter, which I'll explain what that is in, in a second. Uh, we're doing one in, in the north uh, part of the county. And uh, I was told that it was such a narrow venue, the maximum we could fit was one violin standing up. And I said, could we do two violins? And they said, mm, maybe. Yeah, okay, two violins. That's it. Um, so we're doing the Prokofiev Two Violin Sonata in that venue, and um, presenting a festival like this is is a very challenging thing because you have uh, 13 days and everything has to go right, and when something goes wrong, you have a 350 days to stew over what went wrong. So um, <laughs> we really try to get things right, and um, it's, it is a lot of fun. It's very tough, and you have a good, very, very good staff that's uh, keeping the tabs best. on things. The yeah. best. Yeah, the best. wonderful. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, you, uh, we're going to deal with, I want to talk about that Mahler concert coming up at the Performing Arts Center in San Luis Obispo. By the way, one of the most beautiful halls, and be a beautiful, bright acoustic in that hall in San Luis Obispo. What a lucky city to have that beautiful venue. And then, of course, you know, the other gorgeous settings, the various missions and so on. But let's just go back in time a little bit and start with the beginning. Who is this guy, Scott You? How did it all start? You're a violinist. When, when did that happen? Was it family? Was it a particular teacher? What, what got that started? My father, my late father, was a great admirer of Yasha Heifetz and Milstein and Oistrakh and, and Henrik Schering and Arthur Grumio and all those, the, the really great violinists. And um, my mother, when she was in high school, she saw Masako Ushioda play. Masako Ushioda was 
um, a wonderful violinist and a teacher at the New England Conservatory. Her husband, Lawrence Lesser, was the president of New England Conservatory. And there she was um, as, a, as a child listening to Masako Ushioda play, and, and she said to herself, if I ever have a child, I'd like for that child maybe to play the violin. And uh, it just goes to show you that those school concerts really do make a difference. They're very important. <laughs> And so um, I studied music as a child. I wasn't uh, very good for a while, and then um, I got a little bit more serious. And um, was midway uh, in, in high school, I um, won a couple of violin contests, and I started playing quite a lot. And um, when I was 18 years old, I had the chance to uh, play a concerto with the Orchestra of St. Luke's, which is a wonderful orchestra in New York City, they're just absolutely professional and just great players. And uh, Pinkus Zuckerman was going to be the conductor. And Pinkus Zuckerman was kind of an idol of mine, he still is. And I was so excited that he was going to conduct. And we got there, I got my violin out of the case, and I stood up next to the orchestra, and he said, Ah, Scott, you conduct them yourself. <laughs> and I was crestfallen I was because I thought I'd get to put Pinka Zuckerman in my resume and I was so excited about it and um, so we played it was a Bach concerto and at one point the orchestra was playing a little too loud and I just crouched down and the the orchestra just completely deflated and it was the most strange it, it is a really amazing thing uh, conducting uh, because you just move your body you move your arm and suddenly the sound changes. I mean, it's something really, it's an amusement park ride that you kind of want everyone in the world to understand because it, it is just so absolutely strange. Um, and from then on, I, w I would say I was really fascinated by conducting and, and violin. I mean, I still play some violin, but um, uh, conducting takes up most of my time in uh -huh. these days. And by the way, what a compliment from Pinka Zuckerman. He basically took this kid and said, okay, kid, go do it. It's a uh, great compliment. He, well, I'm, I'm, he, it was a life-changing moment for me, and um, he, I, I just remembered uh, right before that, I played the concerto for him, and he said, no, 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 don't do it that way, do it this way. And he took my violin, and he just started playing, and I remember thinking, oh my God, it sounds like the record. It's, it's, it sounds like Pinkus Zuckerman, because it was Pinkus Zuckerman. He was right there playing my violin better than my violin had ever been played ever, and probably better than my violin would ever be played again. It was, it was fantastic. Wow, what an experience. Now, I see in your resume Michael Tilson Thomas. Tell us a little bit about, about that. You, you, I, we understand another, you... another genius. Just, yeah, he's absolutely. a complete genius. Um, he, I, I didn't get to spend that much time with Michael but uh, I actually just wrote him about uh, a month ago, letting him know that I'd just been named the chief conductor of the Mexico City Philharmonic, and I thanked him for all of his help in, in getting me there. And um, I told him, and I meant it, that almost everything that he's told me uh, over my life, I've remembered, and I use mm -hmm. almost every week. Um, just little tidbits here and there. Just uh, Michael is like a... He's like a, you know those jewelers, they're able to take a chisel and they aim it at a diamond and they can just give the chisel just one light poke and it'll just split the diamond in half. Perfectly. He, 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 perfectly. He, he has that kind of brain. Um, the world's not going to see another brain like that for a while. Yeah, and what a great inspiration as well. Also, you, also your anecdote about uh, uh, body movement as a conductor, how, imp how important, and if, when you have a great orchestra like St. Luke's, and professional musicians, they respond to every single body movement immediately. So oh, those, those, those folks are, that, that's um, a, f a friend of mine, uh, Alan Gilbert, who's the music director of the New York Philharmonic, uh, he and I used to talk about, quote unquote, losing your virginity to a piece of music. And what, what, what we meant by that was the first time you do Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, first time you do a Bruckner Symphony, first time you do Mahler, um, there's a certain coming of age that occurs. And um, certainly the first time you either conduct an orchestra or you play conduct like I did, there is something about that that is so disorienting and 
so fantastic, you you realize, oh my God, there's a whole different side to this art form that I never knew anything about, and it's an ocean out there. Um, it's like, you know, it's like Columbus discovering America. I mean, the guy discovered a continent. Yeah. And then 40 years later, you look back and say, how could I possibly have conducted Beethoven V then when I knew nothing? Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I got to say that the more I do this, the more I realize I don't know anything. I mean, the, 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 the more I work, the more ignorant I feel. Um, and maybe, maybe that's true of all art, but I would say certainly with conducting, it's really true. I've been playing the violin for most of my life, and I would say that I feel like I'm not the best violinist in the world, but I'm pretty good, and I kind of know what I'm doing. With conducting, I've been doing it for about 30 years, and I feel like I know it less and less and less the more I do it. It's it just, there's so much to know. Yeah. Now, I'm getting old, uh, and I'm feeling now nearly 70, as though maybe Finally, I'm starting to figure it all out. We're talking about such intense repertoire, such subtext. Right. I mean, it's so complex, and of course, that's what keeps art alive. The, the, sure. the genius involved. Listen, let's get. We better get back to the subject here. Give me a little bit of a, an overview of the real highlights coming up. Festival Mosaic. Well, I'm really excited to be presenting, uh, for the first time in my tenure at the festival, a Mahler symphony. We're doing Mahler's Fourth Symphony, <clears throat> and. In the first half of the concert, we're doing Mahler's Fourth Symphony also, but we're doing it in what I call the notable encounter format, which is essentially a museum docent's tour of the symphony. How does the symphony work? How is the symphony a very classically constructed piece? How is it a departure from classicism? Where does Mahler break the rules? In what way does the piece culminate in the fourth movement, which is a song? Um, why is a boy soprano singing? We answer all of those questions and answer the listeners, the audience's questions in that format, which is, again, called the Notable Encounter. Um, I would say that the Notable Encounter has become kind of the raison d'etre of, of this festival. Um, people come to watch a notable encounter presentation of, say, Schoenberg's Fair Clerk de Nacht, and then they might go get a glass of wine, and then the next night they come back and they listen to the concert of Fair Clerk de Nacht. And I've had so many, just innumerable people over the last five or six years that we've been doing notable encounters come up to me and say, wow, I really wouldn't have gotten it without the notable encounter, so thank you for that. And so we feel like that is our contribution to the art form here on the Central Coast is giving people that that insight um, and that extra layer of information to um, to decode what's happening on stage. And by the way, it's not pandering to an audience at all. Audiences are hungry to get to the bottom, to learn more and more about this very, very complex repertoire. Uh, and it's wonderful for us, too, as musicians. Uh, I've never done a noble encounter without somebody on stage saying, oh, thanks for that because I didn't know that. Uh, we do not water down the information. The information is at, at the level um, and it's, it's information that's useful to us as performers as well as to the listener as a listener. Very, very important. When I was a, a young snot, uh, I thought that was uh, all very you know, unnecessary, but I, I think it's a, a very valuable service that we all need to, as professional musicians, need to render to the public to help them understand the, why they love this music, the, 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 the depth of this art. Uh, right. Now, so we're talking Mahler 4th, that's on when? That's on July 23rd, right? That's on July 23rd, which is a Saturday night. Yeah and it's happening at the Christopher Cohan Performing Arts Center at Cal Poly. The soloist is a young man, a 15-year-old young man named Bobby Hill. We found him because we saw him on CNN singing for the Pope with the most ridiculously perfect intonation, just absolutely pure and beautiful and we, uh, we, meaning Bettina Swigger and I, and Bettina is the executive director of the festival, we knew that we had to have him sing Mahler's Fourth Symphony. And given human biology, I'm 
prob- I'm probably thinking this may be the last, mo- the first and last Mahler fourth that he ever sings. Because mm-hmm. at some point, being 15 years old, his voice is going to change. Yeah, that's so. That's we fascinating. feel very, very privileged that he's going to be singing with us. Fascinating. We have Mahler Four on Saturday, July twenty third. Take us back a little bit. How how does the festival open up? How, how give me a, some a little bit of the fringe. You've got a whole fringe festival going. I mean, it's amazing. We have, we have three fringe acts. We're very excited about. We have a we have a uh, a trio called Intersection. They play everything from jazz to pop music to movie music to classical music. We have a, a comedy duo called Duo Baldo, which is a violin and piano duet. There, it's sort of they have a sort of a Victor Borga act, and they came to my attention because they opened, I believe it was the 2012 Salzburg Festival. They were the first, the first act on Salzburg that year, and uh, they were a smash hit. Uh, we have, I believe, four chamber music concerts. Um, and all of the pieces of chamber music, the composers have some relationship to Mahler. The entire festival has been curated around Mahler. So we're doing the Barrick Chamber Concerto. We're doing the Schubert Trout Quintet. We're doing the Wolf Italian, the Wolf Italian Serenade. Wolf studied with, with Mahler. We're doing uh, Benjamin Britten's Fantasy Quartet, which is a beautiful piece for string trio and and uh, oboe, I've done it before. It's it's one of my favorite pieces with winds. Uh, we are doing uh, oh my god, so many things. Beethoven's Opus 132 String Quartet, Shostakovich's Seventh String Quartet, modeled after Mahler's Tenth Symphony. We're doing Brahms's C Minor Piano Quartet. Great piece of music, maybe my favorite piece of Brahms chamber music. We're doing a Baroque concert at Shandon, uh, which is sort of the north part part of the county, but unfortunately that, that concert is sold out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing a bunch of Baroque pieces on that concert. Uh, we're doing a sort of mostly Mozart. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Dan, that this, this festival was called the Mozart Festival at one point. And in deference to that, and in deference to Cliff Swanson, our founder, uh, we always do a concert of all Mozart or almost all mm-hmm. Mozart. And on this concert, we're going to be doing Mozart's C minor uh, wind serenade, which uh, we string players know because we play it as a viola quintet as well. Uh, We're doing Mozart's 24th piano concerto, and we're doing Schubert's Death in the Maiden, arranged by Mahler. So we have a lot of music going on. I think we have mostly two events a day, sometimes three, uh, and it's, it's 11 days of very intense activity for all of us. Also, I, I, you mentioned that you used the word curatorial. I uh, love programs that have that make sense, you know. So the idea of two weeks of music built in some way around Mahler, around this really, it's, it has to be the culminating work of the festival that Mahler for at the Performing right. Arts Center. There, uh, you know, it's so intelligent, it's so helpful for people, uh, for the for your audience, for me, for professionals as myself. I mean, for uh, it, it's so important to have make sense out of programming. It's so crucial. So I salute you. For we have an advantage because when you are a orchestra, whether it's the uh, uh, L.A. Philharmonic or the San Francisco Symphony or my orchestra, the Mexico City Philharmonic. You know, we we in Mexico City, I have to present 38 weeks of classical subscription programming to our audience, and you can't possibly theme 38 weeks worth of programming together. You you can't do it. But when you're talking about 11 day festival, it's absolutely possible. You can sort of zero in on a smaller target and say we're going to focus on this this year. Let me let me run by, or would you please run by? I want I want everybody in Southern California to know about the, where these players are coming from for the orchestra alone, let alone your guest artists. Just right. throw, throw some orchestra and cities. Right. So we have members of the Cleveland Orchestra, the uh, Houston Symphony, Baltimore Symphony, San Francisco, Los Angeles Philharmonic, Atlanta, St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, uh, the Swedish Radio. Uh, I, I don't really, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but we have um, uh, members of, of many of the, the top orchestras uh, come to, to the Central Coast. People keep coming back because they enjoy each other's company. 
I would say that's one. Um, it's very pretty, obviously, in California, and it's it's nice to be here. And um, I think that we have such a emphasis on chamber music um, for s certain players who want to be doing more chamber music. They really like coming to San Luis Obispo. When I first started running the festival, I was warned by everyone, ooh, you better be careful about the chamber music. Don't do too much of that because uh, people around here are not going to like that very much. And I said, okay, let's just try it for a year, and, it, and if it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll stop it. But it turned out that our chamber music offerings ended up being the most popular things that we, we put on. So we've been, ever since that first year, we've been doing more and more chamber music, and, and we all love it. Bravo. Bravo for that. Let's. Uh, I think we're going to have to wind this down now. Let me let me just run through some of the details. Uh, Festival Mosaic. Let me give the website www.festivalmosaic.com. Go there and have a look at the, the schedule. It's in, it's incredible. Phone number for tickets. Area code 805 for San Luis Obispo. Seven eight one. Three zero zero nine seven eight one three zero zero nine in the 805 area code. Everybody knows about San Luis Obispo. Gorgeous. The weekend. Go up for a weekend. Go up for a day. It's summertime. The hotels, the cuisine, the restaurants. It, it's it's fabulous. There's probably one of the best. The restaurants are fantastic. Yeah. And uh, one of the really one of the best performing arts centers in, in the world, uh, uh, perhaps even Ch wonderful, charming hall about 1,200 I think it seats, mm -hmm. very bright and, and exciting acoustic, uh, uh, on the campus of Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, as you can see and have heard a wide variety of program programming. Mahler Four on the 23rd of July, that's got to be a, a, a showstopper. Tickets thirty dollars to eighty, the, the, it varies. Again, just go to the website, festivalmosaic.com, phone number, let's do it again, 805-781-3009. This is a festival, let me just get up to get the beginning date so people don't uh, forget, July 13th, that's a Wednesday, to a Wednesday, July 20th. Uh, uh, to, no. 20, to the 24th. Oh, 24th, sorry. That's right, that's uh, right. Sorry, thank you, let's do that again, July 13th through to July 24th. 24th. Yeah, right. Of course. Sorry about that. I must no, have been a, it's a, ty a typo, no doubt. Uh, I'm going to have to fire the secretary. Anyway, um, <laughs> Scott, you, it's been a great pleasure talking with you. I can see just from meeting you for the first time, the energy is high. Uh, the mission is a great mission. Uh, it's a fabulous festival. I, I hope everyone will take serious consideration. Have a look at this uh, festival mosaic. Go on up for a weekend. Have a great time. Scott, many, many thanks. Thank you so much, Dan. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.